Solo Hunters Finding Wild podcast is presented by Global Rescue, the world's leading membership organization providing medical, security, evacuation, travel risk, and crisis management services. These are the people on the ground who have your back and who have the resources to get you out of any sticky situation should the need arise. And with Global Rescue membership starting at only 119 bucks, there's no reason to travel without it. Go to globalrescue.com slash solo hunter to find out more. And if you do decide that you need a plan, tell them that I sent you and use promo code SOLO at checkout. Big hole. Put on some frozen boots. Go tread some frozen tundra. We've got two days of solid pack. Stay on this backside until I get right on freaking top of it. We literally have 45 minutes till the plane is supposed to land. This particular episode is also brought to you by Prime Archery and G5 Outdoors. Prime bows are built to be the most accurate on the planet and G5 broadheads are built for the hunt. I personally like the new Striker V2 and I've shot Prime and used G5 heads exclusively now for 10 seasons. And although I'm far from being the best archer on the planet, the amount of accuracy built into the technology of these bows makes me a much more effective hunter. On this week's episode, I'm in Fresno, California at the Spot Archery, hanging out with shop owner Steve Walters and his staff. I've known Steve and his shop manager Brian Landreth for many years, and I really enjoy their company when our paths have crossed, so I decided to swing by their shop while driving down to my son Hudson's hog hunt nearby. Topics of discussion are what makes a good pro shop and why you should use one, building and keeping interest in archery, bow hunting, target shooting, and archery as recreational pastime, removing inaccuracies by proper bow and arrow tuning, defining and curing target panic, how to start learning archery from scratch, break the barriers youth and veterans archery programs in the Fresno area, no limitations to archery including the visually impaired, bow hunting blacktail deer on Kodiak, and compound bow technology and fine tuning. I genuinely enjoyed this conversation with Steve and I learned something new. I highly recommend if you live in the Fresno, California area that you check out the Spot Archery, go out to their 3D range, and check out some of their several events later this summer and fall. I hope you enjoy this episode, and as always, thank you for your support. Is that loud enough for you in your earbox? Yeah, I can, I can hear you Too fine. loud? No, I think it's perfect. Yeah, I'm going to turn mine down a bit. Uh, we could sit here and rehearse it all day, all day long if you wanted to, but... Yeah, might as well just talk about it. Yeah, I say stupid. I say enough stupid stuff. That okay. I'm pretty good at editing okay. stupid stuff out. If you start so. going like this, you know, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you see me start reaching for this button, it's time to quit. Okay. Right? <laughs> Let's stop it off. So. No, so sitting here with uh, Steve Walters, the Spot Archery. Yes, sir. So Steve was just going over here. I was going to ask you um, what your background was, but I think I might have figured it out by seeing how prepared you are just by me walking in this door and seeing what you've got listed out here. So, so you can tell me what your background is and see if I've got you pegged or not. Well, I, I started uh, archery in the mid 80s. So I've been in the archery industry since the late 80s working in the industry, but actually hunting in the 80s. And like everybody else, started with, you know, the father, you know, getting into it um, as well. Um, my father was uh, a rifle hunter, not necessarily a, a bow hunter at all. He really didn't believe in bow hunting, didn't think it could be done out west. It was more of a back east sport. And, you know, trying to one up my dad, you know, wanted a bow to go out there and, you know, hunt and give it a try. And, uh, first year had my bow, went out and got lucky and ended up, uh, killing a little buck with my bow. And so it was, uh, it was a, an amazing experience. I remember, uh, when I killed the deer, I was by myself, just a little fork and horn buck. And I was so excited. I threw the deer in the back of the truck, drove it down the mountain without even gutting it yet 
just to show my dad pulled up yeah, to his house see and see that and see that exactly and so but then we then we proceeded on uh gutting it and butchering it in his garage and he later oh, you know informed me you know like you know next time you know make sure you gut it in the field you know yeah. bring it back down and we'll quarter it and, and process it when you get it back down the hill that's awesome is that in this area did you grow up in this it is area? yeah i'm from i'm from the fresno central valley area of california as well so born and raised here yeah, pulling in here, Hudson asked me, he's like, Dad, is all of California ghetto like this? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it is, uh, but there's a uh, there's a lot of area that's actually really, really nice and so forth. That's what I told him. I said, son, Reno's ghetto is all ghetto. And he's like, no, 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 it's not. So. No. Uh, one thing I'm impressed with Reno, because the last time we saw each other was in uh, February at the NABA show. Yeah, we and, had a, pie, a mountain of sushi. Yeah, we had a mountain of sushi, exactly. And uh, Remy, and Brian Anderson, myself, and you. And I am, uh, I am blown away how good the quality of sushi is in Reno. I mean, I w- when you think of Reno, myself, I don't think of quality sushi. I think of other things. And the sushi you guys there and having your town town is just phenomenal. It's crazy. You guys wonder why I'm built the way that I'm built. It's I blame it on Reno sushi. <laughs> Reno sushi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you grew up in this area, and uh, that's cool. What how, what was your dad's reaction when he saw you pulling down there? Like, was he just genuinely he, stoked? Yeah, he well, he was. At first, he didn't believe me. So I came in. I walked into the front door. I uh, had a bloody arrow in my hand to show him. And then, you know, he, he kind of looked at me and I said, I shot a deer. And he goes, well, where's it at? And I said, well, it's out in the truck. And so they ended up coming out. And then when, he, when I actually, when he actually saw that I did, you know, kill a deer with my bow, um, he was thoroughly impressed and so far. So he was um, actually, made, I think it made him proud at that moment. Heck yeah. I yeah. can't imagine. Yeah. I, was, I was trying to think back when you were relating that story, if I remember what my dad's reaction was because my dad wasn't a hunter at all you know he was no. just like he would just assume that we didn't go out and kill the deer or whatever else even though he supported it and um he, he helped me drag a deer off the mountain once but i i think he was probably excited but just wasn't into it i don't mm-hmm. know i don't know i can imagine you know just like when i saw hudson coming off the mountain with that turkey because he mm-hmm. was up with charles i was laying back in the truck snoozing and they went up and shot this jump shot this turkey and I can, I'll never forget, you know, of course I got it on video now too, but I'll never forget the look on his face and just the smile and just how I, how I felt as a dad, you know? Yeah. My son's 14 years old. He's, uh, he's more into, even though his parents own an archery shop, he's more into the firearms right now. And so, uh, we recently just built him a AR, California compliant AR, which is not really an AR. It's kind of <laughs> looks like an AR. Um, is it, is it Cal- California compliant all the time or just when it needs to be? Uh, it actually is all the time. It is all the time. Um, but he's enjoying shooting that, but I'm looking forward to the day that he gets out and we, uh, starts doing some hunting and stuff like that and, you know, gets his first deer. And, and when I take him out now, it's more for taking him out and so forth. Yeah. I think I saw something on Instagram of you guys, that you guys out target shooting or something, mm-hmm. I think is what it was. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Not that long ago. We were out just target shooting on Sunday. Yeah. Cool. That's fun. Um, so you started rattling off some of your, the things on your list here, which I think are great. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad that you're prepared for that because my tendency is just roll into things, have a conversation, get out, figure out what what's going to be talked about, but you've got it all listed out there. But before you lead into that, I actually am going to pose a question that was just given to me no less than an hour ago from Matt Grace. And for those oh of you listening uh, who don't know who Matt Grace is, I was I just had an hour-long conversation with him down the freeway, burning down the freeway Okay, G1. before I got here and had to cut it off short to get off the okay. freeway to come here. So this is like fresh on my mind. Uh, Matt Grace, is he G... G1. He's G1? Yep. And then G3 is... Uh, Nate. Nate. So this yep. is the Grace family who owns G5 Outdoors and Correct. Prime. Uh, Grace Engineering um, to do a lot of components for guns. It, it, it's a it's an amazing company, pretty cool company. Absolutely. So we had this conversation and we were talking about you. I told him, told him that we were coming down and we were, we were actually um, talking about some of the ways that we can incorporate education and technology, just basically the education of the product into conversations and everything, mm-hmm. right? So one of the questions that they told me to, to lead in with, 
Oh man, pull it up. Oh, this is Ryan. Okay, Ryan texted this to me so that I had it as a note since I was driving. And this might lead into your your topics there. So okay. first, answer this question, and then lead into this, and and I and that'll help answer it. So for the view, listeners out there, why is it important to find a good pro shop? Why is it important to find a good pro shop? Well, the thing is the experience and the knowledge of uh, setting up your equipment properly. Archery is a very specific sport, and attention to detail has to be paid attention to. Um, if the draw length is wrong or if the equipment is not set up properly, the shooter is going to struggle with accuracy. And ult- and ultimately, with this sport, if you're not hitting what you're aiming at, you're going to lose interest. You know, you, you're going to go find another sport to do. You're going to pick up golf or bowling or whatever it is. And ultimately, the industry as a whole ends up losing and so forth. So the experience and the knowledge of a pro shop is going to be able to help the consumer get the equipment properly set up for them, make sure the equipment that they're getting is the correct equipment. They're not just buying something off the shelf. And uh, it's not nothing really wrong with big box stores, but if you get a big box store and one day somebody's working in the tennis department and the next day they're working in the archery department, you're not really getting the your, your bang for your buck and so forth. So, and I, I wonder sometimes if people don't realize that that archery equipment is si- it needs like your shoot it needs to be sized. Absolutely, so you, everything needs like to be fitted. It's not like a gun; you yeah. can just go out and roll into it. There are certain proportions for bows for shooters that need to be established. String angles need to be established. All those things work together in unison to create a platform for a shooter to be successful on. What we're trying to do is put more odds into the favor of the hunter or the shooter, the target shooter, the 3D, or just a recreational shooter. Um, because it's hard enough as is, uh, without any, uh, variables in your equipment. If your arrows aren't set up right, or if your sight is off or your, uh, your level is off on your sight, all those things compound to make it more challenging for the shooter. So if we can remove more variables in the equipment and make the shooting or the group size strictly dependent on the shooter and less, on the equipment, we can remove a big portion of the inaccuracy of the equipment. Right, right. Um, how much of your customer base or people that come in, what what percentage would you break that up into just target shooters versus hunters, archers? Most of our demographics in our Central Valley are hunters. Uh, we, you know, this is our big uh, part of our community. Um, I would say probably 90% of my customers are hunters and 10% are target shooters. But of those hunters, most of them target shoot during the off season just to shoot year round and so forth. So, but I'd say about 90% is hunting as well. We do have a very well-established target market in in California, uh, especially with Southern California and all the uh, redding. Uh, There's a lot of big shoots in California, the R100s here now. Um, So, there is a lot of target shooting in the area, and then also being so close proximity to Las Vegas in January or February now, uh, the Las Vegas shoot, we have a lot of shooters that head to Vegas and, and shoot in the wintertime uh, at the Indoor Nationals. Interesting. Do you do any of that yourself? I shoot? do. Uh, I used to shoot competitive. I don't very much anymore. i just so time dependent here at the shop uh, and so forth. I just don't have the free time to dedicate to the equipment. Every spring, I think about setting up a target bow and getting back into it and have this grandeur ideas. And and then the first tournament comes by and I haven't even set up a bow yet. And then the second tournament comes by and I still haven't set up a bow yet. And by the time we're getting halfway through target season, it's to the point, well, uh, this year is not going to work out. And so... And I'm, I'm more of a hunter by trade. I did target shoot competitively just to become better as a hunter for hunting, for uh, shooting gotcha. and hunting. Well, since I have absolutely no interest in target shooting, we'll direct our conversation towards the hunting if that's okay. okay. That's which, fine. Which, which tends to be about probably over 90% of my audience, and it sounds like 90% of your customer absolutely. base too, right? So. Yeah. Are there a lot of people that would come into your shop that are just raw? No archery experience whatsoever, no equipment to just come in and say, Absolutely. Steve, yeah. where do I start? We do. That, we, that's very frequent. We love working with new customers. New customers don't have bad habits. They don't, there's not bad habits they're trying to break. We can basically have a fresh palate we can start with. Uh, but a lot of our shooters come in, never shot a bow before, or if they had shot a bow, it was from camp. Uh, Boy Scouts, or they did it in high school, or recurve something like that. Or recurve, something. something like that. You know, the biggest thing they remember is hitting their arm, you know, and so forth, and the bruise they have on the arm. 
But they, a lot of people want to re- rekindle that idea. They, they remember they had fun doing it, even though they maybe hit their arm, but they enjoyed the sport. And so a lot of the shooters will come in, a lot of people will come in, and absolutely, they'll come in, we'll get them set up, uh, we'll have a demo equipment. And first, we, you know, we're in, you know, determining what they're going to be doing with equipment. Are they going to be hunting, target shooting, so far like that? And that way we can get the equipment set up right for them. But we'll totally go through the startup process, the setup process, Every bow we sell, it's tuned before it leaves the shop. There's not an untuned tuned bow f- that leaves the shop. So in turn, um, they have a place that they can come practice with. We also have a lot of outdoor shoots, but a lot of you know, a lot of locations that people can shoot with or yeah, shoot at. Sure. Is this your only location? This is our only location as well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why I was thinking that you had another shop somewhere. Maybe. I don't know, just in a conversation in passing or something. Well, I, I have two residents. I live in Fresno and I live in Elk Grove, which is south of Sacramento as okay. well. So my wife and kids are up there. We have two residents. We have a house down here and we have a place up there. My wife works out of Sacramento. So we're down here. Uh, I'm down here during the week and I'm typically up there on weekends and so oh, forth. Really? Or they come back down and so forth. It was We started the business uh, and then my wife got uh, a job and a uh, once in a lifetime opportunity for her. Sure. She's a career businesswoman and so uh the school system's better up there so they end up going up there and they commute down or i go back up and so forth like that so yeah kinda... we just drove through there what an hour and a half to sack uh, about couple two hours a couple hours a okay. couple hour drive gotcha. yeah so, that's even too far man I, yeah right. it, it just get on just put on a podcast and just roll just roll yeah just the... there's a lot of people that probably commute that far every day oh the absolutely work into the bay area or farther I, or i'm longer. amazed yeah there, there's people that live in Sacramento, even in the Fresno area that will commute three to four hours, Southern California every day, back and forth, you know, six, eight hours in a vehicle. And Can you imagine? I cannot imagine. Not at all. I, I have, I am a very staunch believer in Hudson. He's sitting behind me here. He could attest to the fact that there's nothing more soul sucking than waiting in traffic. I hate it so and bad. California has got to be one of the worst states there is. Yeah. For if that. I'm third in line at the stop sign, I'm pissed. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> dang it. I got to wait. All this traffic drives me, drives me nuts. No. Yeah. So. Um, what what prompted you to open a bow shop? Like, were you 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 obviously had some early success killing an animal as a kid, and then mm-hmm. you, you went off to college and whatever mm-hmm. else, I'm sure, and that kind of thing. What what was the process of getting you back involved in? Uh, when uh, originally when I was in high school and first years in college, I actually worked at an archery shop. So that's how you know I loved archery, had oh. fun. So I figured I want to work in the industry and start doing that. Uh, went into college and kind of got out of archery, not working in an industry, but kind of got out of it working, but right. still into it. And I was uh, setting up and tuning friends' bows and friends of friends' bows. And all of a sudden, I'd get calls from, hey, this person referred me over to you. So they'd bring their bows over to my house. I had a you know a little bow room, bow shop set up in my house, and I was doing that. And I was doing that for several years. And finally, I got to the point that uh, realize, you know, this, the market that we have in Fresno and the Central Valley, California, uh, could support another shop and so forth. And so decided to give, you know, a leap of faith and give it a go. You know, my background in my mind, I always wanted to have a shop, but, you know, just that courage to do it and so forth. And then I, you know, got to a point in my life, I didn't want to look back when I was older and regret not least giving it a go and so forth. And so we've been, um, in business for five years now so we're as shops go we're a fairly young shop mm-hmm, but we're sure. we're doing really well you know it's been an adventure to say the least and so forth you know like anything when you own your own business you know you're putting a lot of time in uh, in it initially and as well as currently and so forth mm-hmm. um, a lot of my kudos for the success of our business has to go with my staff you know uh, i could not do what we are this business could not have done what is done without the help of my management, uh, Brian Landreth, my employees. Uh, we're truly a family run business. You know, my wife uh, does the books, my mother in law helps with the books and stuff like that. So we're, you know, totally encompassed internal and so forth. We're really a mom and pop shop and so forth. I think when you're that invested into it, you know, just from a personal standpoint, it yeah. just makes it that much more gratifying, you know, when you do find success with it. And yeah. even when it just makes it, you yeah. know, not necessarily a, a level of success, but it's just like, hey, we paid our bills this month. This is great, <laughs> you know. So. And the thing that I originally brought me to the business was I loved working 
with people. I, I love the one-on-one -on -one conversation. You know, uh, I love working with equipment. I love learning new stuff, learning the technology, but ultimately, ultimately was just working with the individual themselves. Um, and exposing them to a sport that I love so much, you know, um, but what I didn't realize, well, I did, but didn't realize how much it involved is all the behind the scenes stuff that goes on with running a business, especially in California with all our laws and regulations we have in California that I don't enjoy doing, but you know, that, that, uh, is absolutely required. Yeah. You, yeah. Uh, it's a little bit easier in Nevada to, to take a little bit business, easier in Nevada. <laughs> exactly. That's the part that, um, that's the part that, that probably keeps me away from scaling what I do uh, to any significant level. You don't want to start a business I in California? Want, I don't want to run a business. You can no, come to California. I, just, I am not. I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to run a business. No, thank you. I don't want the paperwork. I don't want the headache. I don't want any of that kind of thing. Everybody's a self-contract or an independent contractor. Yep. Everything is expensed. Um, you know, keep it simple. Yeah. So just the just the thought of having employees scares the crud out of me anyway. No, employees are great. I mean, it's it's uh, the camaraderie you have amongst yourselves, and um, and the nice thing is, when you first start, you get your own customer base. But as you expand, my employees have their own customer base now, and so it's nice. Not people are just coming in asking for the owner of the shop, and you know, it, the, they're establishing their own clientele and so forth. So uh, it makes it. Um, uh, a very fun atmosphere to work in. Yeah, for sure. So what did you do before you started the shop? I was, I'm, I'm laying odds in my head that you are, were either, you either got an accounting degree or an engineering degree. Actually, I didn't. I actually, or English maybe. No, I didn't. I actually was in the construction industry. <laughs> oh God. So way totally different. The now the, the main reason why I got into Then you were the estimator then. Exactly. <laughs> um, the main reason I got into the hunting or the construction industry was strictly for hunting. Uh, when I was in college and, uh, out of college, um, it allowed me time in the winter to hunt. So I would try to work a year's worth of work in eight, nine months. And I would literally would take four months off of the year and just hunt and so forth. And the life of being single and, you know, not having a lot of responsibilities and stuff like that, uh, made it, uh, uh, opportunity. It's probably a common thread among the, amongst the hunting hunters. community. And I don't know if it's because um, hunters choose, people that are drawn to hunting choose the construction industry because of that reason, or mm -hmm. if people in the construction industry are drawn to hunting. Exactly. Um, so I think it's probably a little bit of both, a little bit of there. Um, you mentioned to me that, in fact, there was a gal that, that we, we were trying to get in here to have as part of this conversation. And when you brought her up and brought up the background of what she was involved with, like, I was very intrigued by that, mm -hmm. the level of commitment that you've made and the level of involvement to something far and beyond yourself and beyond what, what spot archery is. Can you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, there's an organization, a nonprofit organization in the Fresno area called Break the Barriers. They're independent from us, but we work closely with them, especially in the archery, archery aspect of it. Uh, Heather Fight is their uh, instructor for their organization. Uh, they have all different types of programs for uh, youth, uh, veterans, disabled, uh, able-bodied. But the biggest thing they have is they have a phenomenal archery program here in the Central Valley of California. Uh, they work closely with the vets, and the vet program that they have there is 100% free. They get grants uh, that, that they uh, get for their vet program. Uh, vets can come down and shoot. They have a huge indoor archery range. Um, they can come down and shoot equipment for free. They can shoot. They have their own equipment that people can use or they can use until they decide at that point they want to buy their own equipment and so forth like that, and typically they do. Um, they also have an air rifle program for their vets as well, but also they have able body, they have youth program and uh, for able body and disabled. Um, one of their, they have uh, several shooters that are VI, visually impaired shooters. Um, and they- Archers, really? Absolutely. How does, how does that work? What it is, they actually uh, designed a frame system that the archers uh, use, totally uh, visually impaired, and when they draw the bow back, their hand 
there's a there's a frame with a point sticking out. It hits between their first knuckle and their second knuckle to establish kind of their uh, where their point of reference of aiming is, basically removing the sight. So as I'm visualizing this, they're drawing the they're bow drawing their back, back, reaching their arm about, out, and they, there's a point sticking off. This it's kind of almost off. like a tripod so system. They'll move their arm. Until they'll move they their arm until they point. find that point, uh-huh. and they draw back to their anchor. And somebody behind them will help them kind of visually line up, and they will shoot. And if they hit high. Then they will move the apparatus up taller, you know, so forth in the direction mm-hmm. the arrow is hitting, and they will reestablish and shoot it again, um, and to the point they're hitting the target. Wow. And so their foot stance is very critical. So there's a platform that their feet stand on, so their feet are in the same position, and they can adjust their stance left, right, back, and forth, uh, the height of it. Um, I had the pleasure of three years ago shooting in Vegas competitively and one of their VI shooters was standing, was right next to me and got to was shot on the same target, but as I did. And it was absolutely just awesome to, yeah, to see. Cool. I mean, it's in Vegas in this room with hundreds of people and this visually impaired shooter sitting there and shooting great scores. I mean, once they get it established and they're on target, it's amazing how accurate oh, they that's are. Cool. That's and cool. I mean, they work in amputees, you know, uh, shooters shooting with mouth tabs is very common and so forth. But, you know, archery is one of the few sports, it's a totally inclusion start. Anybody can do archery. Mm-hmm. I mean, visually impaired people, amputees can shoot it and so forth. So it's a sport that really anybody can shoot. There's no limitations to archery. Yeah, and um, to me, you know, you take, take hunting aside, take the, the competitive archery side of it aside, it's such a great activity to go out to your backyard Absolutely. and just plink arrows. You Absolutely. Know? I mean, that's what we did all growing up. There's probably a lot of people out there that either maybe retired from hunting or mm-hmm. don't hunt anymore or, or re- that just enjoy going out and plinking arrows. Yeah. And that's one thing that I always enjoyed was there's the no stress or anything else Absolutely. and it's, it's therapeutic it's like going and hitting a bucket of balls except for you're not getting ticked off exactly you know? so. we have shooters that come in frequently uh you know by membership they come in and shoot but they'll come in after work they get stressed out at work they come in you know we say hi to them they kind of grumble at us as <laughs> you, they walk back in out of the way you know and then they go and they shoot and they, and they come out of the range you know 20 30 minutes later and they're happy they're smiling and yeah. stuff like that and life's back to normal and uh, we have quite a few shooters that do that. I tell range. you what, just the rhythm behind it, the repetitiveness, the the nature to it, the thought process that goes through of every transition of you know, pull out of the quiver, you know, cross the bow, knock the knocking point, you know, feet position, draw back, anchor, mm-hmm. aim, breathe, pull the trigger. Just that repetitive motion and everything. There's got to be a, a significant level of therapy to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I do the same thing. I get stressed. I'll go on and grab my bow and go shoot in the range. And I'm at home. You know, I can shoot at my house as well. So frequently, you know, just grab my bow and go shoot. This podcast episode is also brought to you by Prime Archery. Prime bows have some of the most advanced technologies and are backed by the most advanced warranty in the business. Check out the new line of Synergy Logic bows with axle to axle lengths from 31 to 39 inches. Parallel cams that virtually eliminate cam lean. Synergy grip technology that provides unparalleled balance in hand. The Flexus AR roller guard to reduce side load and riser torque while shooting, and much, much more. Prime bows will make you a better shot. Also brought to you by G5 Outdoors and the G5 lineup of broadheads. From the all steel fixed blade Montec and my favorite Striker V2 replaceable fixed blade to T-Bone's favorite Dead Meat and Waddell's favorite Havoc expandable broadheads. 100% steel, 100% tough, and now with the new BMPs or ballistic match points, tuning your bow to broadheads just got that much easier. G5 Outdoors is an American made company. G5 products are designed to hunt. a lot not as much as i'd like to you know uh i do i love to shoot uh recently started picking up a recurve again and started shooting a recurve um did you shoot your deer with a recurve or with a compound it was a compound bow okay it was a compound bow because we're talking back in the mid 70s right no this was mid 80s (laughs) yeah not quite that long ago (laughs) yeah but pretty archaic compound bow to today's standards and so forth but, oh, that's great. But, but picking, picking up the recurve, um, didn't, been doing some hunting, killed a few hogs with my recurve, um, going to Alaska in November, uh, Kodiak Island, uh, again. So I was, a few, I was there a few years ago. 
you weren't there last year. I wasn't there you last year. Before. Okay. Year before that's, last. We yeah. talked about that. That's right. And had a great trip. And there was six of us that hunted. We ended up killing uh, fourteen bucks mm-hmm. on the trip. All archery equipment. So six of us are going back again this November. Some, uh, some of us are bringing recurves. So That'd we're great. So we're going there. It's a target rich environment, and yeah. so we're going to go there and give it a try with our recurves. Just try to avoid the bears and. Chase, and and uh, you guys did the boat. You stayed off on a boat in the yeah. We stayed the on the boat. Yeah, we're doing the boat stuff. Just the uh, we we've debated on camping and staying on the boat, and I don't know. You know the, what? The, the having the convenience of the boat and not having to worry about bears at night. <laughs> right. And you can hang your clothes in the engine room, and they're dry by morning. Their boots are dry because yeah. it's a wet environment. Uh, length of days are so short, so it's really yes. sixteen hours of dark. So you're in a tent a long time. So. The convenience of that, but you know, th- they just drop you off and you're on your own hunt. So it's basically a floating hotel that you, t- you know, yeah. you're utilizing. So I did the tent thing this fall or the, this last November, mm-hmm. Austin and I, and uh, that's that's the part that I remembered the most is it felt like you woke up, you went hunting, and then all of a sudden it was this, dark. It was getting sun sunset, and you're like, exactly. where, where did the day go? Exactly. And you spend so much time in camp in the dark. And then there was always that thought in the back of your mind. When's the bear going to come? Exactly. What's that twig snapping and, and stuff like that? And we were whacking and stacking. I mean, from, from the very first night that we got there, we were we were creating a meat pile. Yeah. You know? I mean, and so... It, constantly you have this thought in your mind so i can see the i can see the stress relief that it might be to, to stay on a boat or something yeah and and also we could fish off the boat too because yeah. you know you wake up in the morning it's still dark you know you we can go up there you can fish off the back of the boat and yeah. you know at night we can play cards and stuff like that so and then you know the biggest thing you go out there and you can hunt and you get a deer down you could take it you know take it back to the shore they'll mm-hmm. pick it up take it back to the boat and you can continue on hunting and so yeah. forth so yeah pretty good pretty good experience I I don't know yeah I I want to go back and do that I want to take my brother back with me <laughs> and see and then I of course you know I cheated I went and we were stacking stuff with a rifle obviously but um, that's what we were we were there for but I want to go back with a bow and just yeah enjoy it's, it's it. an unbelievable I mean if I recommend that hunt to anybody. It's a very sure. reasonable hunt. I mean, we saw caribou, we saw bear, we saw mountain goats, a lot of fox, a lot of upland game birds and stuff like that. So there's no no doubt most of the animals we encountered had never seen a human before, you know. That's so a great way to experience coastal Kodiak. For absolutely. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Um, what else did you have on your list there? I think I, I went we, through, there's one more question, but we haven't got quite to a topic of conversation uh, yet. To we, have a, we have a 3D range. Indoor? Uh, uh, outdoor. Outdoor Where, 3D. Is that near here? Or? It is. We have a, we have an outdoor uh, 3D range that's located about 20 minutes outside of Fresno. Uh, it's a weekly uh, Thursday night 3D we do. We're frequently, it's 20 targets. Um it's a, the range opens at four o'clock to sunset every Thursday. So it allows shooters to get off work at their convenience, show up and shoot. So it's not a shotgun start. You don't have to show up at six or seven and so forth. Whenever you get there, you shoot. It takes about an hour and a half to shoot the course. You're going to walk about a mile and a half. So we put some hills and angles and stuff like that. So you're going to get some exercise as well. But we put out 20 different 3D targets on the course. Uh, and we set up the shots challenging, but not unrealistic we have compound stakes to shoot from traditional stakes to shoot from and then but we're also frequently changing the course around we're changing the targets around the shooting location around always being very cautious of safety and so Mm -hmm. forth Um, but that way allows a shooter to go up there and actually get real world practice you know practicing in your backyard which is fun or coming here in the range and shooting 20 yards is a great time but we have shooters that come here and shoot 20 yards and they'll pound the spot at 20 yards and they'll go up and shoot our 3d target and they're barely hitting the target. Big difference. It's a big, big difference. You know, you start inc- you know, incorporating angles and so forth and really shooters don't have to pay attention to their bubbles and third axis leveling on sites. You know, people start paying attention to how important that becomes, uh, shooting into the sun, you know, uh, shooting into the shadows and, um, all those things, uh, take practice for a shooter to become, you know, proficient yeah. at. It's a different look. Um, I feel more comfortable shooting at a 3D target than I do at a flat target. Like, just because I feel like I've got a lot more points of reference. There, exactly. You know, and, and it's a little bit more natural. So I tend to shoot a little bit better 
um, accuracy wise at a 3d target than I do at a, at a just a flat paper. Yeah. But. And a lot of shooters that way, we have shooters that just gravitate towards paper targets. And, but majority I'd say our shooters like the 3d target it gives them that life size experience that they, you know, target they can shoot at and so forth. Um, now, is that a membership thing that they can it do? Is is, it is not. You just show up. You don't have to be really? a member. It, it, it's, it goes through the spring and summer. Mm -hmm. It Our last Thursday night is the Thursday before our, or two, two Thursdays before our deer season opens. Because that opens here mid-July, is that well, what? Well, here it's August. Uh, August, middle, uh, third week in August is here, and our coastal season opens uh, mid-July. Gotcha. So gotcha. far, so our coastal range opens. you're kind of right in the middle. Someone could, could hit either range within just an, an, hour, an hour or two. Absolutely, yeah. Gotcha. But uh, but allows shooters to go up there and shoot. And it goes, you know, it's like 18 weeks that we do this. It's not a competitive environment. It's just a practice environment. You go up there and just have fun and shoot. We put out the target stakes for people to shoot. We give them scorecards if they want to keep track of their scores for them to you know gauge to see how they come do week to week and so forth. But if shooter gets to a target stake and the target's too far or they don't feel comfortable shooting that far or that distance, they can walk up to whatever distance they want sure. and shoot it. And yeah. so you know we want to make it sure it's fun. That's what I tell people. In fact, I ran into a couple. I was up at the BHA rendezvous and I ran into a couple that um, that I had. I think I had crossed paths socially, you know, on mm -hmm. social media or something a few years ago. They're fans of, of the show and everything, but they were talking about, they were asking, are you going to be at, at total archery? We were talking about that. And the lady was like, yeah, but I, I really don't like to go shoot at that. Um, and she didn't really, we, we talked about it. We're like, well, you know, you, the whole group will shoot from the marker. And then if anyone else has got a recurve or something else, you shoot whatever you everybody want. scoots on up yeah. and you shoot it again, you know, or yeah. whatever it is. So it's not like, it's not like anyone is out there to criticize anyone no. else. It's such an individual sport and everyone's there to support you. Just like a lot of people really want to see, see somebody succeed. And so, Absolutely. um, hopefully we talked her into doing it. Hopefully we talked her into going. Hope and so. Shooting, so are you going to attack this year? So I'm going to go to Salt Lake, probably Park most City. Like Park City. Yeah. That's going to be a new venue. Yeah, um, I was really excited about that, but the venue kind of tripled or quadrupled in size because of the RMEF. Mm -hmm. Elk Camp is going to yeah, be there that the, same the week. World Championship Calling. And the, and the World Championship Calling stuff. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on in addition to Total Archery. So I think they have 3,000 registered shooters, but they anticipate another five to 8,000 people within that really? group okay. just there for Elk Camp. So it's going to be a pretty large, large. event. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so in talking with Matt before, I was like, yeah, knowing that, I'll probably just stay home, you know. But then okay. you think about it from, you know, a marketing standpoint or whatever a lot of exposure. else. All right, I guess I better show up, mm -hmm. you know. So um, we'll see. Are you going to go up to that? Or? I won't be making it this year. It'll be the first time I'm not making it this year. Yeah. So we just got busy stuff here at the shop. It, it, it happens to be the same weekend as our coastal deer season opens. So uh, this is a time of year we pay our bills. And so got to be here to pay our bills and so yeah, forth. For so. Sure. But I absolutely love Total Archery Challenge. I mean, they're a great shoot. I'm going to try to get up to the uh, big the big sky shoot. I'm going to really try hard to get up there. It's I haven't done that one yet. Brian Anderson keeps telling me to go up there and give that one a try. And so. Yeah, the problem for me is it always falls, obviously, the week after TAC or mm -hmm. in Salt Lake. But it's kind of a deadline week for me because it's the week before my hunting season starts. And so I'm generally funneling episodes and trying to get everything buttoned down and dialed so in for the rest of the season so that I can go out and hunt. So that's always, but I'm really going to, really going to try hard to get out there this year. So just cause I heard that the venue is amazing. Um, I, I love Montana. Any chance I can do to get up there, I want to do. And it's just something, something fun to do right there. Just, I mean, just a week before you go out and, yeah. and hunt. So I heard it's not as extreme as what the bird was and so forth, but the, where the, uh, vendors were in the lift and the food was all in one area. So people kind of loitered and hang out in the same area mm -hmm. versus the bird was, everything was scattered one side or the other. So you had gotcha. to walk to get to different areas. And it so. seems like it's always just scorching hot there. It's at snowbird too. <laughs> it is hot. Boiling my skin. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll see. I'd like to get up there, but, um, what else? Um, we also do, uh, hog hunts out of the shop. We have a, a ranch that we hunt out of as well. Um, we is that 
did uh, did Matt and those guys come down and hunt one after Redding? Was that you who they came down and hunted with, or was that um, someone else? They well, they were planning on coming down several times. I was trying to get uh, the Graces down here and several of the people from G Five down here, but it, it's never seemed to work out with their schedule. We have a great hog ranch over on the coast that we hunt on. Uh, has a lot of pigs on it. Um, it's within probably two hour drive of Fresno, so it's not far. Awesome. It's literally 15 minutes outside of another town. So uh, there's a rustic deer camp that you we can stay at, or if somebody doesn't want to camp out there, you can stay at a hotel and there's restaurants 15 minutes away. But it, yeah. it's kind of, it's weird. You're on a little mountain range and you're surrounded by uh, cities all around you yeah. and you get in there in the middle and you literally disappear. I mean, you don't hear cars, you don't hear anything, but you get on top of the mountain, you look at, you'll see 101, you'll see freeways, you'll see, you know, high rise buildings and stuff like that. So oh, but it's, it's a, it's a cool, it's a cool that's place. Fun. Speaking of that, you brought up the graces again. So I, there's also someone else. There was a conversation that I had a couple of weeks ago with Dave Baronio. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know who Dave is, he's Holl does some stuff for Outback Outdoors. He's a guide out of Wyoming. Just recently did some guiding and stuff in New Zealand. Anyway, good friend of mine. I've known him for a long, long time. And he's recently come down with this state of target panic. Do you have and he And I told him I was coming down here to see mm -hmm. you, to talk with you on, on my way to Hudson's Hunt. Do you have any, um, and Matt also struggles with target yeah, struggles panic. struggles with a little bit hard. From hard what I've heard, he he's does. never, he's never told me directly. Oh, he's, a, he has it. He has it. <laughs> but it, so what do you, have you come across any techniques or do you have any schools of thought on how to remedy that? Uh, tar pretty much almost every shooter I know that gets into archery and sticks with it will eventually get target panic of some form or the other. Don't, don't, don't say that. I've never got it. it. Do it, not say that. But eventually it typically most, does. Uh, most everybody. Most everybody. Most everybody. <laughs> most okay. everybody there you does. go. Not There's excluded. very few people uh, that I've seen have been shooting for a long period of time that at least don't go through some episodes of target panic and so forth. So first, first um, for anybody that might be listening that might not know exactly what that is, why don't you set up and define what target panic is and then well, you set what, up the cure for it. What target panic is is basically the overwhelming need to hit the target or the spot each and every time. And basically it's an anxiety the, the shooter has to hit that spot. Uh, if you shoot at a target 100 times and, and you miss a target once, you focus on the one you missed and not the 99 times you hit it. And so what shooters will do is they put so much pressure on themselves to hit the spot, um, their mind starts taking over subconsciously and basically starts, to c starts controlling the shot sequence for them. So when they're aiming at the target, and as soon as the pin gets near the target, they automatically fire the shot. They, it sounds weird, but you feel, you, know, you feel like you really can't even control the trigger. And when shooters initially, when they get that, they start playing tricks or they try to start tricking their brain to uh, compensate for it. They start shooting low. You know, they'll hold a six o'clock low on the target. Well, after a short period of time, your, your brain catches up on you. And all of a sudden you start getting target panic holding six o'clock low. Or shooters will put their 30 yard pin on the target and they start tracking their mind. Well, to, I'm just going to hit low, so I'm I'll use my other pin. Exactly. So I'm just going to uh -huh. use my 30 yard pin and so forth like that. And again, your mind will start catching up to it as well. So those are all just band aids that shooters do to eventually uh, not actually fix the problem. And it actually just expands on the problem. Um, the, one of the biggest things, especially for release shooters, to start training with if they got target panic is a hinge or a back tension. Basically what it's doing is it's taking the mechanism of your index finger or your thumb out of the equation and you're basically applying back pressure uh, to pull through the shot. And so basically it's almost like a coach. Basically all you're doing is aiming at the target and pulling through the shot. Uh, and over a period of time you start training your brain again that it's okay to have a pin on the target and not fire the shot. Um, what shooters frequently do is in a very short period of time of doing this, they start feeling good. It's like, okay, you know, I don't have target panic anymore. You know, a week, a month, even a couple months go by and all of a sudden they start going back to their old habits or they start going back to their old shooting style. And inevitably that will start catching back up with you again. Once you have target panic, you will always have target panic. It'll just be how well you control it and so forth. I've had target panic worse than anybody in my life in the 80s. I mean, absolutely hmm. horrible. I wouldn't say I have target panic now, but I have it very much under control and so forth. And the biggest thing is when I feel it, and it's more of a feeling sensation when during the aiming process, 
I can recognize it. And shooters, you know, being able to ID when it's starting to happen. And at that point, you can take a step back. Okay, you need to do your proper steps and so forth to be able to uh, help get you through that shot sequence. But a hinge release is a great tool uh, to use for a shooter who has target panic as well. H hinge release meaning it being it doesn't, there's no trigger or anything. Your hand has to be in the right position. Your hand has to be in the right wrist. position. You're using your back tension to pull through the shot. And it's also uh, known as an anxiety release. Basically, it anxiety. Gives me anxiety. It's yeah. like, I don't know when that sucker's you, All go. you're doing is focusing on the target. And the biggest thing is what actually creates target panic is actually the target. Once you remove the target out of the equation, target panic goes away. So if somebody has target panic, I could put a target on the wall in a range. They can't hit that target. But as soon as I take that target around, down, and I said, okay, just shoot the blank bale. Don't pick a spot. Don't pick a bale pin. Don't pick an existing hole. Just aim it down at the target. And just squeeze a shot. They can squeeze a shot. So it's actually the target itself. And that target either being a deer, or an elk, a 3D target, or a paper target, is, you know, is that's what creates the anxiety is actually the target itself. So blind shooting is a very good technique. Shooters that have really bad target panic will actually start blind shooting. Basically, we just have them just execute the shot, squeezing the trigger off, and getting used to the surprise of the trigger going off. Shooters don't like, the initial shooters typically don't like the feeling of the release going off without them knowing. They're not in control of the situation. What's, a, what's blind shooting? Blind shooting is basically when you're shooting at a target or a blank bale. So there's no target at all. And no aim point. No aim point at all. All you're doing is working on yourself and your form. No different than if you had a golf net in front of you and you're swinging a golf ball. You don't care what direction that ball is gotcha. going. You're just working on your swing and so forth. So, but we will... Uh, blind shoot on the target for an extended period of time so they start getting feeling comfortable getting the shot and then the shooters with the extreme conditions can't you know they have a hard time doing that actually through the shooting sequence i actually will lay my finger on their finger and they'll just hold their finger stationary and i'll actually slowly engage my finger on top of their finger uh talking to them through the whole time the process and so i'm actually i'm the one actually shooting the shot triggering the shot to go off and getting used to them feeling the bow going off without them knowing. Uh, that's an anxiety fact that shooters don't like is when the bow goes off and they do not know when it goes off. But if we can remove or if we can have the shooter be surprised, we're removing a huge portion of the human element out of the bow and uh, make it, the overall in turn going to make the shooter more accurate. All they're doing is focusing on the target, squeeze, or pulling through the shot, squeezing the trigger, and the shot goes off, and wherever your pin was is most likely where the arrow is going to go, and so forth. Yeah, I can guarantee you, wherever the pin was at when you pull the trigger, <laughs> sure. that's where the arrow is yeah. going to go. Yeah. So, and the thing is, you know, good thing is, you know, shooters that have it, you know, just periodically, every once in a while, you know, shooting during your shooting practice session, just go out there and shoot. Don't shoot a three D target. Don't shoot a target. Just. I mean, I'd stand in my garage and I shoot three, four yards in front of my garage just at a, a block target, not shooting at a spot or don't, you know, you're not picking anything you're shooting at. You're just basically working on your form, your strength training and so forth as well, developing that muscle memory uh, and just getting used to that shot surprising you each and every time. That's what I was going to bring up is the technique that I have for practicing shooting because I live in a neighborhood, so mm -hmm. you can't just go out in your backyard and, and shoot. I got into a habit of having my block inside the garage. So you're talking eight, 10 feet, 12 mm -hmm. feet, you know, 15 feet at the max. And I'll do it with a bear shaft. And that for one, that helps me with my grip and everything else there. But as soon as I release the way that that shaft reacts, I can see if I did anything. If you're with torquing my grip the bow, you got facial pressure. And it's just repetition. Yep. Just 100% yep. repetition, just shooting bear shafts. And yeah, it's if just your bow's tuned to bear shaft and you practice with a bear shaft, it'll absolutely be an indicator of what you're doing with your bow. If you're torquing left or right or so forth, getting the string pressure in your face, all those things will be telltale signs by the, the way the bear shaft is impacting the target. I'm, I'm a firm believer that in a hunting situation, you'll never eliminate hand torque or any any other of those elements totally like, you know you can minimize those a little bit but there's always going to be just that level of ad adrenaline that's going to cause you to grip that bow sooner or do something at some point you know quick shoot a little bit so it's the more you can get yourself consistent muscle memory the yep. better off you're going to be when those you don't have to think about it you just go through a natural motion yep. you just go back and you don't even think about it. the shot go you know you sh there's a deer elk come to full draw how many times can you remember uh, shooting an animal, you draw back. How many times can you remember leveling the bubble? You know, all going through all the motions. Very rarely do you have that opportunity when you can actually 
not you're very not often do all those yeah. things right yeah so. you, it's you know you everything becomes instinctual it just everything yeah. just happens it has to be yeah. it has to be so. yep great anything else you got on on your list i do have one more question posed here from these uh, we, guys we do that hunter appreciation barbecue okay let's talk about the hunter appreciation barbecue okay again keeping in mind that we are here in fresno north fresno north what north is this? fresno northwest fresno northwest yeah, fresno right in the middle of california California, you you wouldn't think that it would have a very large hunting population, but if you look at um, tag purchases, tag sales, absolutely. If you look at heck, if I just looked at my merchandise sales, the amount of product we ship to California alone, the numbers of events that are held here in California, um, particularly on the archery side of things, the amount of waterfowl hunting and stuff that yep. takes place here, it's yeah. incredible. California is a hotbed for hunting. I mean, yeah. demographically, percentage-wise, we have a very small percentage-wise of hunters per capita in the state of California. But because we have so many people in California, that small percentage still equates to having a large population. Smaller of per people, capita. Smaller per capita and mm-hmm. so forth. We have a huge hunting community yeah. in, the, in the California area. Especially west of the I-5 or east of the I-5. East, east of the I-5 yeah, as especially. well. West of the I-5, it becomes a little more liberal yeah. over in that area. I mean, there's still hunters over there and there's quite, you know, there's hunting over there. But most of our business comes from the east of the I-5 area. This podcast is also brought to you by Onyx Hunt, creators of the most comprehensive digital mapping system for hunters. Download the Hunt app from the iTunes or Google Play Store and use promo code SOLO for your 20% discount at checkout. Also brought to you by BlackOvis.com. Search the word Solo Hunter to see all the great Solo Hunter branded gear that they carry. Link to my recommended product guide and gear list. Order yourself a custom built arrow setup from their custom shop or just browse the website for all the latest gear. Given that area, you were going to talk about a, an event that you guys have specifically for this shop. Because I want, if, if any of you listeners are out there in this area, you know, and you don't have a home shop already, I encourage you to give Steve a, a look at his shop and his staff. And um, particularly if you're interested in the Prime bows, you know, obviously I'm a supporter of Prime and, and Quest and have been for a lot of years. And in, in all honesty, if, if I didn't have, you know, such a close personal relationship with Matt and, and Nate and Ryan and all the, the, the family there Mm -hmm. at at g5 i'd still shoot the bows because if you look at it on paper it is if if your mind could match the paperwork it's the most accurate piece of equipment ever created if 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 the human capabilities could match what is what it shows on paper unfortunately we can't and we're all different and different bodies react different way but i would still be shooting a prime bow you know regardless because it's it's what makes me an act the most accurate I can be. And it's one of our most popular bows we sell. We're not a brand specific shop and we don't want sure. to be a brand specific shop. You You'd know, be crazy to be. But, you know, when somebody comes in looking for a bow, we set up multiple bows at the same draw weight, same length, uh, demo with the same arrow. And that way we go into the range and we talk about the technology of each bow manufacturer. But frequently people, once we get a prime bow into their hands, that's the bow they end up going with and so forth. That, that was going to lead me to this uh, part of this other question was how do you go about setting someone up? And you just kind of explained that. You do set up multiple bows. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and frequently we have people come in and, and their buddy shoot, you know, one brand and, you know, they, they want to come and shoot another brand and they'll come in and we'll set up and have them shoot that brand. But why they're here, we'll have them shoot alternate brands as well. Um, and frequently some, they will walk out with a different brand they initially walked in, walked in sure. to get. And it's just exposing them to the different technology. They like the brand, the initial brand, but they maybe liked another bow a little bit more. And if they wouldn't have the opportunity to try that, they would never have known. And we just want to make sure that people have the options to choose from. So that way they're deciding, they're telling us what they want versus us telling them what they need and so forth. Because ultimately the best bow for the shooter is the one they feel the most comfortable shooting. You know, we're going to, we're, every bow, you know, all the manufacturers build great bows. There's not a bad bow manufacturer out there. They're all tunable. Uh, But they do feel, they feel different and they shoot different. And, you know, ultimately what feels good to the shooter is what recommended and so forth. But we will set up multiple bows, have you try them out and go on the range shoot as long as you want and get a feel for them and ultimately uh, then you can pick what bow you like um what is it that in your opinion that draws someone to a specific brand you you kind of alluded to it 
a little bit with uh, my buddy shoots my buddy shoots brand X, so I want to shoot a brand X. Correct. What would you say is the number one thing that drives someone to be to a brand? Well, in our area, it has to do what their friends are shooting. That's a big thing that we see. If you know, if, if a, a buddy amongst a group is getting into hunting, he's going to ask, "What are you all shooting?" Mm-hmm. You know. And they're all shooting relatively the same bow or the same manufacturer. Instinctually, they come in, and that's the brand they're going to ask for because that's what all their friends are shooting and so forth like that. Uh, advertising has to play a big part. There are certain manufacturers that do a really good job marketing. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, they come in and say, you know, I want to shoot this bow because such and such celebrity shoots it. Exactly. I Tim saw Burnett this. Burnett shoots this bow, so I want that bow. Exactly. <laughs> we get that all the time. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure not. Um, which also kind of an interesting point is it it took, when when Prime, they've always been a solid limb Correct. bow from the very beginning. And that's always fit my eye well. Even mm-hmm. when there was some other some other bow manufacturers 10 years ago before I started shooting Prime when they first, when they first started, I still couldn't shoot their split limb bows. I, I had a, a Hoyt bow for a while, split limb. I just, it just didn't fit my eye and mm-hmm. my feel and my mind of what I thought was the, a structural integrity of a bow. Mm-hmm. When Prime went to the split limb bows, I told Matt, I was like, nope, no, nope, I'm going to shoot this bow. And so I shot the old bow well, again. the year before for, when the Logic came year. out. And then, then, um, because the Logic was the first split limb sure. bow. Mm-hmm. Then the CT3 came out, and I was like, okay, I'll I'll give it a shot. The split limb technology, I believe, personally, is a superior technology of the mm-hmm. solid limb. Uh, by widening the limb pockets of the bow, they're stabilizing it. They're also uh, helping. They can uh, do different limb deflections to adjust cam lean. So basically, there's developing a, a platform more forgiving for the shooter and so far to shoot. But also more fine tunable as fine well tunable, right? absolutely. you There's can actually tunable. swap out absolutely. limbs and do different and so things to, to adjust to exactly. a specific shooter if a shooter comes in and he's torquing the bow a lot and we can't get rid of a certain tear we can actually swap limbs around to adjust it you know adjust that as well and so forth without actually altering other things such as the arrow rest and so forth that will later will down the road can uh create other tuning issues down the road and so gotcha. forth so yeah, there, there's more tunability with the new bow. They they changed up the the parallel cam a little bit. It's Correct. a little bit wider. Correct. Which um, you'd think with a split limb, maybe it'd be narrow, but it's wider, so it actually gives you more more integrity, less cam lean, right? Absolutely. By it being wider. Yep. Which, also, they um, oversize the axles, which is great. You know, uh, oversize over, the axles. So the ax- over the diameter of the axles on the prime bows are bigger than standard diameter axles. So in turn, the integrity of the axles there. Over a period of time, uh, we've seen axles bend. Uh, it's covered under warranty through manufacturers, but they're just addressing things that can happen over a period of time to make you know a more solid piece of equipment. And then the Synergy technology, uh, for someone that doesn't understand about that, with the Synergy is it basically raises the center shot. Correct. What it does is it raises up and puts basically most bows, the center of the bow is the center of the grip. Correct. Prime bow is the center of the bow is the center of the throat of the grip. So it's raised everything up on the bow. By doing this, they've put majority of the mass weight of the bow below the riser, below the grip. So in turn, the bow is not a top-heavy bow. Uh, by doing this, it also helped the bow stabilize. So it wants to naturally self-level. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have a bow that's a top-heavy bow and you're holding it, you're basically gravity's fighting you to hold that bow level. If the weight is below the bow, Gravity is now working with you to level the bow. So if you have a hammer in your hand, you're holding the hammer upright with the hammer on top, your gravity's fighting you. But if you take that same hammer and invert it upside down, now all of a sudden gravity is working with you right. and so forth. Um, they're also, by doing this uh, and have their two different cam sizes, they're also addressing uh, vertical uh, knock travel on the bow, which is a tuning issue that we have to address with many manufacturers. And by the split limb, and the dual cam, they're addressing cam lean, which is also addressing horizontal knock travel. Right. So frequently we see on prime bows versus other manufacturers, shooters can sometimes shoot an actually weaker spine arrow mm-hmm. because there's there's no knock travel to it. There, it's not traveling vertically or horizontally during the shot cycle. Your arrow is going to mimic whatever your bow does. So if your knock or D loop is vertically moving or horizontally moving, 
through the shot cycle. Once the arrow leaves that bow, that arrow is going to mimic what that movement has done. And what then would be the advantage of a weaker spined arrow, greater arrow speed? Absolutely. Um, Sometimes more, more accuracy, more accuracy, yeah. more front of center. But it's just a, it's a you know it has a very forgiving sweet spot. One thing we just see when we tune prime bows is the sweet spot of the bow is very forgiving. We get a lot of different shooters that have necessarily initially bad hand position, or they're punching the trigger, or they're getting a string on the face, and all those things are not being shown with erratic arrow flight because mm -hmm. of the technology built into the bow. Gotcha. I think they've got it dialed at this point. Like it's a lot easier to tune. I mean, obviously you can always work on things, but literally, I mean, from last year I took my, we were just talking about this before I took my rest and my sight off of my synergy. And I literally just swapped everything over to my logic CT3. Didn't even, I, mean, I went out, shot some arrows, everything hit exactly where it was at, went out and killed my buck, and and, and I still shooting it exactly oh, yeah. how it is right now. Haven't made any adjustments or any changes to it, even though I'm sure there's some fine tuning that could yeah. be done to it. Well, frequently when we set up a new bow for a customer, I mean, we go through everything on the bow, make sure the bow set up properly. The bow, I mean, but many times we'll go through, go to our, you know, shoot it through paper for our very first shot, and our very first shot through the paper is a perfect bullet hole. You know, very, very, very minor adjustment if needed on the bow. Yeah, I know how anal you guys can be. I've spent a lot of time with Riley uh, Warwood at the bow shop. Yep, great talk, guy. Great, great friend shop. of mine. You know, he sets up my bows until this this last one that I just rushed set up. Um, but he, um, when we set up my initial bow a couple of years ago, he he wouldn't send it home with me until he, in fact, we got it all set up while we were there shooting that episode of Prime Pro. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't let me take it home because he wanted to spend more time with it, you know, just because he's like that anal about yep. wanting it. But it, it's just, you guys, pro shop owners tend to have, especially, you know, you guys that actually are working in the shop and not just an offsite owner. There's a lot of vested interest in a person's success and in making sure that everything that goes out that door. Oh, absolutely. You know, the biggest, you know, I love, we always tell our customers that go out the door, you know, you know, if you, you know, you don't have to be successful just because you shoot an animal, but go out there. We love hearing stories. People come back, the experiences they have, the encounters they have, maybe they miss a target, you know, maybe they miss the animal, but their experience they had was a life changing experience. And basically they are now a bow hunter for life yeah. and so forth. You know, majority of our bow hunters that we have are from rifle hunting and majority of those rifle hunters who become bow hunters are now bow hunters, you know, that they're not, they still rifle hunt, you know, expand their hunting season, but they're putting in for archery tags or looking at the archery draws and so forth. They're planning their vacations around the bow seasons, mm -hmm. you know, tag opportunities are easier, uh, to get tags, uh, shot our opportunities, encounters of animals are typically more common, uh, less hunting pressure. Like you say, less hunting competition. Way yeah. less hunting competition. You know, some of our zones in California, it takes four or five years to draw a really good zone in California with a rifle. You know, you're two to three years with a bow. So you can double your amount of time and more encounters, you know, and so forth when you're having it. More opportunities yeah, and so forth. We, I mean, uh, you you know Matt pretty well, right? Yeah, so very he, well. he pulls out this spreadsheet. And I can just visualize it as they're in this conference room when I'm on the phone. He's, Matt's got a spreadsheet. Sure he does. Of course he does. Well, archery's down. You know, the archery mm -hmm. participation is down um, from its peak in 2008, 17, no, 2008, 2016, 17, mm -hmm. kind of its peak. So it's down at 2010 levels, mm -hmm. you know. So we've kind of had this that rise and it's down um, for, per, for archery participation. What's the remedy for that? Um, just... Educating, I don't know, uh, educating people, you know, the benefits of hunting, what it does to, you know, how uh, it helps wildlife. You know, hunters are the number one conservation people in mm -hmm. the industry. Um, what about archery in general? You know, I mean, is there is there a level of participation on the tar tar target side or other things that... Or just recreationally? Yeah, recreational because, you know, just on? getting people exposed to the sport. You know, we have a large customer, you know, I think some shops just focus strictly on hunting or some shops just strictly focus on archery or target shooting. We like to incorporate the recreational aspect of it. You don't have to be a hunter to get into the sport. You, you don't, don't have, have to be, be a tournament. You yeah. don't have to be a tournament shooter. You can just come in and shoot your bow, go to shoot in your backyard, go out, go camping, take your bows with you and go camping. Just, you know, just go out and just have a good time with it. You know, we have a lot of people that don't do either hunt or target shoot, 
but they come in with their range. You know, you can get a, a, a good quality entry-level recurve bow, arrows, glove, and arm guard for right around $200. Yeah. You know, it's it's very inexpensive compared to other sports that you can get into. And once you've invested into that sport, archery, it's a very inexpensive sport to continue on. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like, you know, snow skiing. You know, it, I got friends that snow ski, and every time they go snow skiing, it's $200, you know, every yeah. time they go. You know, it's very expensive. Um, archery is not that way and so forth. You know, you, as long as you're not breaking and losing arrows, you know, it, it, you can shoot the same equipment for years and years and years. Yeah, if you're hitting the target, you know, you're not right. going through arrows. Those exactly. the babies will last you a long yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. We are seeing a growth here in archery in California, I would say. Mostly, uh, a lot of it has to do, I think, personally, is uh, the restriction of our Second Amendment rights that we have sure. in California. Sure. You know, shooting uh, firearms in California is becoming harder and harder. You know, just at the end of this month, there's going to be a total state lead ban. Yeah. No and lead in California at all, unless you're target shooting. It's already you know, on for, for big, big games. Big game for, nor, for for most of the state, northern part of the state, uh, but basically the whole rest of the state is going to be banned, mm-hmm. a statewide ban except for target shooting. Um, also, uh, ammo registration. You're going to have to have background check and registration for ammunition coming up so far. So really? restricted to having to do that in California. See, all this incentive to be a bow hunter, man. So, so people are looking to... You can get a bow. There's no background checks in California, at least yeah. not yet. Yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> you know, you don't have to register your arrows. Yeah. Yet. Uh, yet. They're not having to do the hassle. They can come in and it's, it's a shooting sport that you can enjoy. Uh, you don't have the hearing issues and stuff like that, shooting the, you know, the bow and stuff like that you do with a firearm. Uh, you can shoot it most time. Most people can shoot it on their own property if they have it. You can't shoot a gun on your own property and stuff like that unless you live out of city limits and so forth. Yeah. I, th- I think that the recreational part of archery is, is a level of conversation that needs to be had uh, that, that isn't being had right now because maybe it's because, uh, you know, the groups that are so vocal about it are those, or is the hunting group. Mm-hmm. The group that's most vocal about archery are the hunters or they're the they're tournament shooters. And a lot of, if not most, 3D sh- tournament shooters are hunters as Absolutely. well, right? And, and so – there's that huge level of just recreation. So I think it's, we kind of need to take it upon ourselves to figure out a better way to maybe promote the recreational use of archery equi- equipment. And, uh, you know? Like um, yeah, we have uh, 25, 30 Girl Scouts coming in tonight. To that's shoot. awesome. That's awesome. Uh, we work closely with scouts, um, uh, uh, 4-H, FAA. Um, we also do uh, corporate team building exercises for mm-hmm. Corporates, they want to come in looking for something different. They come in and shoot and have a good time and so forth. Another good thing that people don't realize is archery is a great date night. Take yeah, a girl. Heck yeah. I mean, how many you know, how many times you can go to a movie? You can go have dinner. Take her to an archery range. You know, it's usually yeah. pretty inexpensive. You want to flex your muscle in front exactly. of your woman? Go to the bow range. Go to the range. Rent some equipment. I guarantee she's going to have a good time. She's going to remember that what long before long after she remembers a dinner or something like that yeah, so promote a date night and stuff like come down and shoot a bow yeah so. i'm gonna do more i'm gonna do better at that because right? i've had my wife and kids out shooting you know mainly just in the summertime when it's nice when i think it's definitely something that for the health of the sport and for the health of the industry we all need to start talking about a little bit more and participating in more and instead of going like you say that's a great point instead of going to the movies or going to paint clay pots yeah go shoot a bow go shoot a bow yeah you know, turn off some stress absolutely have a good time you know go there and you know get some basic instruction and just have fun yeah yeah i agree we're here now what is it today june 10th yes june sir 10th. have you got any activities or anything coming up that person can come in and meet you and meet the staff and participate in and well get one, introduced one thing we have going on is opening day of our uh archery deer season for balance of the state, not our coastal deer season. So it's the third week in August. Opening day of deer season, we do a hunter appreciation barbecue. And what it is, is we go up in the mountains, uh, take a trailer, barbecue trailer, all the supplies. And basically uh, we set up we set up in an area where a lot of hunters uh, hunt. There's, it's a very popular area and this is all public property. And we do this barbecue for hunters and it's 100% free. Hunters can come by. We provide lunch for them, uh, 
drinks, soft drinks for them as well. We also set up some 3D targets for people to shoot. But basically, it's our one day that we can get so many hunters together in a location and we can give them back, you know, because they're a huge part of our culture. They're a huge part of our economy in our area. Uh, they don't get, they're not appreciated very much in California. And this is our one way that we can pay back to them the one, you know, this day that come by, have some lunch on us. Uh, we have wardens come by and the wardens visits with the hunters, the hunters visit with the wardens. They both realize or both of them aren't that bad of people. Yeah, nobody's out to get anybody. Exactly. Just do you know. what's right. Um, and, and again, we'll feed anybody. Comes. I mean, we've had, you know, cyclists come by, you know, we've had fishermen come by, you know, uh, even an anti-hunter wants to come by and we'll, we'll provide a lunch for them. We'll, you know, sit down and sit down and talk to them and, you know, tell them, you know, all the benefits of having, you know, what hunting does for the community. Are you, and serve, are you serving up wild game? We do not actually. <laughs> Surprisingly, we don't. Uh, we do mostly tri-tip sandwiches, um, hamburgers, hot dogs. Yeah. We have homemade chili. Actually, last year we did buffalo chili yeah, and stuff that, like that. that so that, that works. But it's you know, last few years in a row, we've fed over two hundred hunters have stopped by hmm. our, our our area, our barbecue. So it's becoming well known in that area, and so people will go hunt in that morning. And in the middle of the afternoon, typically opening weekend is very very hot here. You know, it's a yeah. hundred hundred plus degrees. So it's just a morning and evening activity. We set up in the, in the afternoon, so we're not, we don't really want to bother a lot of the hunters in that area. And then we're usually out by 3 o'clock and stuff wow. like that. But, but it's, it's, it's a way that we can pay back to our county community. And yeah, stuff that's like fun. That. That's good. That's awesome. Well, I'll be hunting California that week. I'll be uh, opening week, but I'm going to be quite a bit farther north. Where Hope, are you going? Hopefully it's not going to be 100 degrees. I don't know. I uh, met a group of guys at Wild Sheep Show. Okay. Sh- sheep Show. And... I think they were all a little bit tipsy because okay. they were very, very loose with information. And so I kind of invited myself to join their hunting party and their group. And later on, they followed up with it and said, are you serious about coming and hunting with us? And I was like, hell yeah, I'm serious. If you guys are serious. That's awesome. And it's all snowballed from there. And they cool. said, the only prerequisite is we'll tell you where to park. We'll blindfold you and be prepared to have brush and sticks and everything hitting you in the face hey. for the next six miles. Perfect. So whatever happens happens i'm gonna make sure my will's up to date and everything before cool. i leave town but um there's some I, really good hunting in california you I have a good time believe it's b zone okay so i believe you know it's got to be in the trinity alps yeah. type of an area um jason some Columbia so Black we'll see hopefully uh, i mean you, it's public land there's going to be hunters and stuff around yeah. but good group of guys that i've got to know and i um, really if, looking forward to that if you can get that far back you'll be able to get away from people yeah six the, the miles gets thrown around pretty loosely, loosely. I, i've found but in, in talking with these guys that they, they seem pretty legit like you know somebody that works hard when, when you meet them yeah so we'll see even if cool. it's three miles that's a distance that's a poke so. well, good luck this good, good luck this fall yep i'll let you know okay steve thank you very much i appreciate your time Thank you, sir. Thanks Get for coming by the shots. Yeah. Glad to have you here. Oh, you bet. You bet. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks again for all the continued support. And please be sure to email with your questions or comments about the show and hit that dang subscribe button and leave a five-star review of the podcast. As always, stay humble, stay safe, hunt happy, and get out and find your wild.